So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40 plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Welcome to this week's Energy Show. Now this week, we're talking about energy prices in general. I'm going to include gas for our vehicles, methane gas for heating, the old-fashioned word for that is natural gas, but it's anything but natural, electricity for our buildings, and no doubt in my mind that we'll all be paying a lot more directly for energy. And we're going to pay indirectly for energy in all of the goods consumed around the world. Now, the situation right now is pretty bad, mainly because of the Ukraine war. But it's getting worse because of our economy, our world's structural dependence on fossil fuels. You know, these are fossil fuels that are traded all around the world. So what happens in one part of the world has a huge impact on direct energy prices in other parts of the world, and also the goods that we're purchasing. And this is not a short-term issue. This is going to be a long-term issue. It's just we're getting hit with some really big spikes. So we're going to talk about what's causing these, these increases in energy prices. But we're also going to focus on what the realistic solutions are that you, my listeners, can really take advantage of. All right. Now, the fundamental energy issue that there's only a few countries in the whole world that provide most of our fossil oil and natural gas methane. These countries are the Middle Eastern countries. Obviously, we know about that. The U.S. and Russia and all other countries around the world have to import these fuels. Now, the surprise (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, this kind of doesn't make sense based on what we see happening with energy prices. But the surprise is the United States is energy independent. You look at the Energy Information Administration and they pointed out that in 2021, the U.S. was a net exporter of 3 million barrels of oil a day. We are also net exporters of natural gas. So we're shipping out. Three million more barrels every single day of oil than we're consuming in the country. Now, hooray. It sounds like we've solved our energy security problems. We've got plenty of natural gas, too. Sounds like a good thing. In reality, it's no protection at all against high oil, gasoline, and natural gas prices. This snowballs into everything that's made in the world and also into our electricity costs. I'm going to kind of focus on two BS facts about the high oil and gas prices. And when you hear about the fact that the U.S. is energy independent, that doesn't jive. Well, here's why. Now, first, I was listening to a radio interview last week from one of the oil and gas industry executives. And the topic of the interview was, why are oil and gas prices so high? Well, this fossil fuel industry executive correctly pointed out that oil is a worldwide commodity. Correct fact, right? The price of oil in the United States is not determined by our own internal supply and demand issues. It's determined by the world price of oil. It's traded as a commodity around the world, and there's a Brent price and the Oklahoma price, whatever. And those prices vary, fluctuate throughout the world at the same level. So the price of Brent crude is the same whether it's delivered in Europe or in the U.S. So there's nothing we can really do about it. And so what, what happens is the U.S. drilling companies, they're drilling for this oil, they're processing it into gas, they export, they send it out of the country, this 3 million barrels a day of oil and, you know, whatever we're shipping out as as gas, at the world price, regardless of their production costs, which do not significantly change when there's more supply or more demand. So when the world oil price goes up, For example, if there's a big war in Ukraine and the countries say we're not going to buy Russian oil anymore and we're going to have to buy more oil that's drilled in the Middle East or in the United States, the price of oil goes up because there's a less worldwide supply and the demand is about the same. So there's less worldwide supply. So instead of the U.S. oil companies saying, well, we're going to just keep everything in the U.S. and therefore it's going to be good for the country, they say, no, 
we're beholden to our stockholders and our stockholders want us to maximize profits. And, you know, me as, as an oil industry executive is going to get a bigger bonus if our stock price goes up, if we're more profitable. So what they do is they ship the oil out of the United States at the world price. And then when that oil is converted into gasoline, it's converted at world price level, not at what it really costs to drill. And so it's kind of total BS that the U.S. prices go up because of the world price. The U.S. prices go up because of the world price and the fact that the supply and demand is a global issue, not local, not in the United States. It used to be that we weren't in the U.S. allowed to export oil. And then we had so much oil, the oil and gas companies made a lot more money. There's a little bit of a quid pro quo. Uh, it actually had to do with the solar tax credit. I'm not going to get into that now. But the U.S. prices go up because the oil drillers can export the oil that they drill for at the world price and make a ton of money. So, yeah, candidly, if the United States wanted to do something about high oil and gas prices, releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve isn't going to make a significant difference because we're going to release that oil and <laughs> that's going to kind of go into the U.S. market at the world price and more oil is going to get exported at the world price. So it's not going to make a difference. So the only two things that we really can do in the U.S. to keep oil and gas prices low are restricting exports and keep these fuels in the United States, which is not going to happen, or we tax the windfall profits of the oil and gas companies, which they've got a tremendous amount of lobbying. That ain't going to happen either. Okay, so that was one perspective from an oil industry executive. <laughs> Listen to another interview about why the gas prices went up so much. And this was kind of a different situation, but unfortunately the same result. And I asked him a question. When I filled up my tank in my old car, I just wanted to fill the tank up. It was almost empty anyway. It cost me $6 a gallon to fill up my tank in San Jose. Total was like $113. It's the most I can ever remember paying for gas. Now, I know oil prices were about $125 a barrel. This is the global world price of oil. It was about $125 a barrel. And it cost me Six dollars a gallon to fill up the tank. But the oil that was in the feedstock, my gasoline was made by oil that was extracted probably, undoubtedly, from a U.S. well about a month ago. So when oil prices a month ago were $90 a barrel, this was kind of before the Ukraine started going crazy, that, that war. And a month ago, oil prices were $90 a barrel. And gas prices, I looked it up, $4.32 a gallon. So the gas refiners immediately raised the price of the gas to reflect the world price of oil and didn't factor in the fact that, hey, you know, that when they bought that, when that oil was converted into gas, it was only $90 a barrel for oil. So the gas refiners and the distributors, and I don't know about the gas stations, I think they just kind of make, you know, a, a small percentage of a profit on every gallon they pump. But the refiners and the distributors... They made a 40% windfall profit. They sold gas at $6 a gallon based on $90 a barrel oil prices when, you know, in fact, that they raised it up to $125 barrel oil prices. So they made a windfall profit. And you also may notice that the prices at the pump go up a lot faster than down. Now, the transportation costs go up a lot too, but the prices go up because the gas station, probably the, the refiners and the distributors say, hey, we can raise the price really fast. And the only reason the gas prices at the tank actually come down is through competitive pressure. And the, the distributors are saying, hey, we better lower the price a little bit. And the local gas stations will also play games and see what, what the gas station across the street is selling for. But this is not going to change. So there's windfall profits that the refiners and distributors make because they're pricing their gasoline product at what they can charge for it, not what it costs them to create. And by the way, I'm talking about gasoline, I'm talking about these are regular gas prices. The diesel prices are going to go up even more than gasoline. It's just a little bit more complicated and to refine diesel. All right. Now, what about natural gas? We're heating our homes and our water and our generator electricity from natural gas. First of all, let me correct you. Let me correct everybody. And I'm going to just you know, change my, my terminology. We call it natural gas. It comes out of the ground naturally, but it's actually technically methane, one carbon atom, four hydrogen atoms. And methane 
is 25 times more severe from a global warming perspective than CO2. So if you take one cubic foot of CO2 compared to one cubic foot of methane, that methane is going to make global warming 25 times worse. So it's really bad. So we kind of got that nomenclature out of the way. We're not going to talk about the natural gas anymore. We're going to talk about methane. The methane prices are also way up. And I was just looking at my PG&E bill last month, and I was charged by PG&E $2.10 a therm for methane. Now, a therm is 100,000 BTUs. Yeah, who knows what 100,000 BTUs is, but unless you're a geek like me, but that's the same as 100 cubic feet of methane. All right, so imagine a cubic foot and just 100 of those, right? So that's a therm. Last year, the same time of year, my natural gas, my methane, sorry, my methane costs were $1.59 a therm, and now it's $2.10 a therm. So methane, went up 33% over the last year. I'm not really sure why, but maybe just because they could. All right, now, here's what's happening with world supply of methane. Europe's trying to replace their methane supplies because most of it's supplied to Europe from Russia. And so they're turning off, there's a Nord Stream 2 pipeline that was a new pipeline that was going from Russia into Europe. They're not even going to turn that on. There's a Nord Stream 1 pipeline. It's been in place for many, many years. That's transmitting natural gas from Russia into Europe. That pipeline's really, really leaky. And all natural gas pipelines are leaky. So that natural gas, that methane, leaks out of the pipelines, and it's really bad from a global warming perspective. So what the U.S. is doing and other countries are doing, actually not really that many other countries other than the U.S., what the U.S. is committing to ship as much natural gas, liquefied natural gas or liquefied methane gas to Europe. We get the methane in the U.S., we run it through a plant that chills it, liquefies it, puts it into these huge tankers that basically have liquefied gas, everything's really cold, and then they put it on a ship and and it goes to Europe and then it's offloaded into the gas pipelines and there we go. The dilemma is it takes a lot of time to build these gas terminals and obviously it takes time to ship them. And so what's happening is, although the worldwide supply and demand, there's an immediate impact on oil and gasoline prices because the refiners can change that pretty quickly, the prices of methane don't change so fast fast. So methane prices, I believe, are going to continue to rise on a world basis and even in the U.S., but they're not going to rise as fast or as variably as oil and gasoline prices. So as I said, my methane costs in San Jose from PG&E went up 33% over the last year. That means that if you're heating your house with methane, with a furnace, your heating costs are going to go up 33% a year. And if you're generating your hot water with a gas heater, almost everybody's using that, it's going to cost you 33% more for heating hot water. And most of our electricity, 50% of the electricity in the US comes from gas. So a lot of that electricity is going to get more expensive. It's it's just side effects from electricity, from furnaces and, and HVAC, and also from hot water. Okay, now let's look at electricity. We talked about oil and gas. We talked about methane for heating water and heating the air. Now let's look at electricity rates. Now, the best data I could find was from the Energy Information Administration, and I looked at California's energy costs over the past 20 years. And the EIA has really good data historically because they just look at it historically. And the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, terrible when it comes to projections. They're basically always saying, oh, the fossil fuels are going to be X and the solar, wind, renewables, they're never going to grow that fast. But they've been constantly wrong. It's just ridiculous at this point. But I looked at the historic rates for electricity in California and I kind of broke it out. They have good average data, but that average data doesn't kind of break out homes versus apartments. So I just made a little bit of an adjustment that reflects what home is going to use instead of just all ratepayers, which has a lot of apartments and shared family housing. So here's the data. From 2000 to 2015, I fit this on a curve and the home electricity rates went up from 2000 to 2015 of about 3% a year. This is based on EIA data. It's pretty good. It's the average. It doesn't take into account things like peak rates and time of use rates and really huge consumers, but it's just an average up 3% a year for 15 years. Then from 2016 to 2020, the electricity costs started going up at 6% a year. Wow. Doubled the rate of increase. That was from 2016 to 2020. And then 
in 2021 and this year so far. I mean, heck, we're you know just kind of going into April 2022 so far. The electricity rates in California have gone up 10 percent already in 2022 and 2021. 2021, obviously, it's real. 2022 rates went up 9%, and there's more increases this year. So that just kind of blew me away that electricity prices are going to continue to go up that fast. So 10% in the last two years, that's 21 and 22. Before inflation hit, So there was a little bit of inflation, but these increases were done before inflation really hit the rate-making cases. So, and it was also these increases over the last few years before the impact of a lot of the utility grid investments for wildfires, for transmission lines, for battery storage, and EV charging. So I wouldn't be surprised with continued inflation. I'm not saying inflation is going to stay at 7%, but heck, inflation has been down around 2%. And now, I mean, the last year it's been 7 So I expect inflation to continue, maybe 5%, maybe 6%, maybe 7%, I hope not. But I would be very surprised with all of the investments that the utilities are making on infrastructure, on fixing their maintenance issues, on transmission lines, burying 10,000 miles of transmission lines, on putting in battery storage, EV chargers, things like that. I wouldn't be surprised if the electric rates continue to increase at 8 or maybe 10% over the next 10 years. I mean, that just kind of blows me away. 10% on an inflation-adjusted basis over the next 10 years. That's huge. So, heck, what can we do? It sounds like these things are completely beyond our control. So let's kind of look at what each of us can do about gasoline prices, about methane prices that we care about for heating our homes and heating our water and making electricity and just electricity prices in general. All right. So when it comes to gasoline, kind of a no brainer, just shop around for cheaper gas. I've noticed when I was driving around the the San Jose neighborhood, I saw differences of like a dollar and a half a gallon. And this is credit card price for regular gas. So easy to find. If you go across town, you can save $20 $20 when you fill up your 20 gallon tank. And you know, well, boy, if you're thinking about trucks that have 30 gallons or are even bigger, boy, that's a lot of savings. All right. So shop around for cheaper gas, kind of a no brainer. Candidly, I've never noticed a difference between gas at a no brand station or gas from, you know, one of the branded stations. And that's because it all comes from the same factories, from the same refineries. So you can fill up at a cheaper place. It doesn't have to be one of the branded stations. All right. What else can you do? Take public transportation and drive less. You know, it's inconvenient for some people. It's a necessity for others, but that's not a bad option. Get a more efficient car. That's what people have been doing for the last 40 or 50 years. They've been buying cars with smaller engines and better fuel economy. But boy, this is kind of a tough environment because of the supply chain crisis that a lot of these automakers have. There's not a lot of cars available. The dealer lots are pretty empty. You don't have a lot of choice. So it's tough. And you want to get a used car? Well, you're shopping around for a car that gets better mileage. The used car market's really, really tight. You might not even find something that's going to have that much better mileage because everybody else is looking for that and they can't get the new car. All right. Next thing you can do, get an EV obvious. It makes sense. Some people have to drive too much. Some people don't have a convenient place to charge. Some people just don't really believe in EVs. I'm going to put all that stuff aside. I'm just going to tell you the reality that what I'm experiencing or what other people experience. The EVs are much cheaper than gas cars to operate. I read a recent article, the total cost of ownership, and this is before gas prices started to go ballistic. The total cost of ownership was on the average $4,700 less for an EV over the lifetime of the car. And that's accounting for everything. That's accounting for the fact that the EV is going to cost you more, but then you have to account for the fact that the maintenance is negligible. I mean, really, you got to change your windshield wipers every couple of years. The brakes hardly ever need to get changed because you're, you're using regenerative braking. There's no cooling system. You have to worry about the antifreeze. There's no pumps to brake. There's no belts to go. It's just really simple. And over the lifetime of the car, $4,700 savings. That's a huge amount. And so you're just kind of looking at the day to day. Okay, heck, how much does it take to fill up my tank? Just kind of comparing the experiences that my family had over the last few weeks. My wife filled up the tank in her car locally. Her car gets about 25 miles per gallon. And so to drive 100 miles, she needed four gallons of gas, cost her $24 at $6 a gallon. She shopped around, but that was the best she could do at the time, $24. 
At the same time, I went on a, a long trip in my EV. I couldn't charge up at home. So when you go on these long trips, you have to charge up at a DC fast charger. We'll have another show on this. But when you're traveling, you can't wait overnight to fill up your EV. You have to find a fast charger and they're pretty much everywhere. I pulled into a 7-Eleven and the 7-Eleven had a gas station. This was Sacramento and they also had EV chargers. So I parked my car and in about half an hour, 20 minutes, I stayed there for longer because I was doing some email. But I got 100 miles of range on my EV. So it's 100 miles and it cost me $15 at the fast charger compared to that same cost would have cost my wife $24. Now, granted, my wife filled up in about five minutes and it took me half an hour to fill up, but still pretty good. And I could have filled the whole thing. I could have totally recharged the the car, but I didn't really need to because I figured, well, I just need a hundred miles of range because when I get home, I'll plug in at home. And if I charge my car with regular PG&E off-peak regs, it would cost me maybe $2 to add that 100 miles of range. But I charge my car from home on solar and it cost me only a dollar. So a dollar for 100 miles if I'm charging my EV from solar, $2 for 100 miles if I'm charging my EV at regular utility rates, and $15 if I have to charge at a public DC fast charger. Huge, huge difference. Okay, so that's what you can do for driving. For heating hot water, I've got one word for you, heat pump. Sorry, that was two words. So two words for you, heat pumps. Now, heat pumps are powered by electricity, but they're three times more efficient than standard electric heating furnaces and standard electric hot water heaters. And that's because you're able to move the heat from the air. These are usually air to air heat pumps. You move whatever residual heat you have in the air surrounding the heat pump into the hot water or into the house's heating system. It's like an air conditioner. It is an air conditioner, but it works in reverse. You know, when you're running your air conditioner, you go outside, you have hot air coming off of that compressor unit with the fan outside and inside you got cold air going in. Well, Heat pump just reverses that, and on your heat pump, you're blowing cold air outside. Maybe on a 40-degree winter day, you're getting 30-degree air coming out of that heat pump, and then you got hot air coming into your house. When you're heating hot water with a heat pump, same thing. The hot water gets hot, and then the exhaust from the heat pump is cold air. Very, very cool. And so that my advice is, I'm not saying run out right away and get heat pumps because it's always expensive to replace appliances and heat pumps cost a little bit more than regular units. But when your appliance dies, when your hot water heater dies, when your gas furnace dies, that's the time to put in a heat pump HVAC system or a heat pump hot water heater. And you're going to get the best economics that way. If you want to do it now for a variety of other reasons, for environmental reasons, or you just want to get it out of the way, or you're renovating your house, yeah, do it now. It's a good idea. But definitely when your old equipment dies, put in a heat pump because at regular utility rates, it's cheaper than a methane hot water heater, natural gas, or a methane natural gas heating system. And if you have solar on your house or your business, it's way cheaper. Okay. All right. So we talked about gasoline. We talked about heating systems, hot water furnaces. Now let's talk about just electricity in general. Well, costs are going to continue to go up. I wouldn't be surprised to see electricity in California continue to go up at 10% a year. We've had 10% over the last two years, and I don't see any end in sight. There's no escape from this as long as you continue to live in California. You go to another state, you're probably going to see similar increases and similar impacts on the economy. So there's not a lot you can do. The only way you can escape those increases are basically put in solar, put in a battery storage system, and you get a lot of benefits from that. Obviously, if you've got battery storage, you've got backup power for your lights, your fridge, your heating, your car, if there's a blackout, and as people convert more and more to electricity, and if there's a blackout, well, they don't want to be without those requirements of life. They don't want to be on Gilgan's Island. So batteries are really, really helpful. Okay. So bottom line, world energy costs are going through the roof. U.S. energy costs gasoline, methane, electricity, they're going up fast. And they're going up fast even though we are, quote, energy independent, unquote, because we're shipping our surplus energy overseas at the world price and not keeping it in the U.S. to keep prices down. It's easy to take matters into your own hands 
Just get more efficient vehicles, shop for gasoline, get more efficient appliances, and taking the next step, installing your own rooftop solar and backup power. All right, that's all the time we have on this week's Energy Show. Thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. And if you missed any of today's show, you can always go to our website at cinnamon.energy and listen to the podcasts. So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real-world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40-plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Barry.